Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. I wrote a column for the New York Times back in March 2003 about the imminent invasion of Iraq. By then, all hope of reasonable heads prevailing had vanished. Mr. Bush, I said, will have his war. We are about to watch the tragedy unfold. Now here we are, more than 11 years later, having lost thousands of American lives and expended trillions of dollars, and Iraq is an absolute and utter catastrophe. No one, on the left or right, believes there are any good options available for the United States. We will talk about this sorrowful state of affairs and related matters with my guest, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the editor and publisher of The Nation magazine. Hi, Katrina. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Board. Thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. So, I mean, it was madness then, back in 2003, when Bush and company, you know, invaded Iraq, and it's madness now with Iraq fracturing and yeah. people debating about, you know, whether the United States should intervene and, and, and what's appropriate, et cetera. What is your take on this tragedy that seems to have no end? Well, first of all, I think we need some historical memory. We need um, to remember um, that it was, it was Bush's invasion in 2003 that contributed to what we witness today, this regional sectarian war. But the history of Iraq also contributes to this. I think we need to learn that uh, American interventionism has um, often in unintended consequences which can lead to more insecurity, more chaos. I think we need to hold accountable those who led us into this terrible misadventure, whether it's the neocons who continue to speak out from our newspapers and on our TV sets and meet <laughs> the press, or the, you know, the, the liberal hawks. Um, what I think this sh shows us is that this situation demands a political and diplomatic solution. It also, as you said, there are no good options, and one can't be easy about it. But to strike militarily would likely f inflame the tensions and the problems on the ground. And I think America over these last, this last decade, though we're coming back to it, has lost the ability to think more politically and diplomatically. That's been degraded in this ongoing global war on terror. The president in his West Point speech began to nod to right. trying to think of military force as a last resort. And I, you know this well, you've reported on it. This country is war weary. I mean, you have a poll out just today, 74% of Americans, you know, they don't want combat. When you go into the strikes and things like that, it breaks down a little more. But this country is war weary wants a way to engage the world in different ways. And we're not just war weary, the, um, the armed forces themselves are in trouble. We've been sending these kids over for three, four, and five tours at a time. We, we've got materiel problems and, and that sort of thing. We're not in any kind of shape for you know, it's, war. It's a very t I think it's very tough for Americans to think and understand the, about the, the limits of American power. It's not that we're declining. It's that we need to think anew about the world we live in. You're right. You talked about the cost of war. Joe Stiglitz and Linda Billings yeah. estimated that from 2003 to today, we're looking at $3 trillion and something you've written about, 425,000 vets with brain injuries. Isn't that something? I mean, this is a cost um, that, you know, leads one to want to throw tomatoes at the TV set as one listens to those who took us into the war and now sit there and say, let's go back. We don't need armchair warriors, Bob. What we need are people who understand how we can sanely and smartly fight terrorism. I think one of the great tragedies of Iraq and the reaction to 9-11 was to go onto a war footing. Intelligence, policing, tough measures, but occupations, land occupations, occupations of a country that had nothing to do I with 9-11. I was just going to say, in the case of Iraq, it actually had nothing to do right. with it. And the cost, we're seeing, so the costs to this country are great, economic, moral, human, um, and the costs of security. Where are we as, you know, we're, we're no better off. And I think that's largely the Bush administration, though the Obama administration did not break with the paradigm of the global war on terror, that horrible acronym, GWAT. Um, it's tried to move away from occupations. It's tried to say we're going to end these wars. We'll see. We're sitting here. We don't know if there'll be military strikes, and I've never seen a surgical military strike. That whole uh, language I, you've I, talked. I, to. I agree. That is. That's just. And the talk of drones. There is yeah. a very good outfit in London. I think it's called the International Bureau of. But you know, in Yemen and Pakistan, we've seen drones used, and at least a thousand people killed, many many civilians. And once you get into that, 
you've covered wars. We, we've not had good coverage of that either. Uh, the American people don't have a good understanding of what has happened with our drone warfare right. and the innocents who have been killed and, and, and that sort and of thing. And that is a collateral, that's collateral damage of, the, of this global war on terror. You've written about this country. I, when I said moral, I think this country lost, has lost its bearings. You talked about the insanity on the eve of the first Iraq yeah. war. Um, there were few sane voices. And I think we, we've seen a country willing to jeopardize too much, or let me reframe that, an elite, an establishment, willing to give up too much of the principles of this country in exchange for the fight on terrorism. So we've seen the Patriot Act ran through with very little opposition. We've seen surveillance state emerge. We've seen covert warfare and drones. And I think it's going to be very tough, Bob, uh, for Americans to uh, try to Drones are video games for a lot of people. Well, the that, media treated it as become, become and now, it can't. Uh, that, that it's, it's a video game. So Americans think that you can just go in there, um, kick butt, you know, and then chant USA, USA, and, and come, come home. We don't get good coverage of what has happened right. to so many of the veterans of uh, the wars in, in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq. Right. Uh, we don't have a good understanding of the um, economic costs of those wars. I, I do think that the press has fallen down uh, over many years over now many years. On, on the coverage of, of these I issues. I mean, we did a whole, we did a special issue on the c civilian costs of war in Afghanistan and the drone war. Yeah. On another front, though, just as we sit here, your paper, the New York Times, you know, I can't speak for its on-the-ground coverage. I mean, many of those journalists are brave to be there and No cover. question. But, you know, on Monday, I couldn't, you know, you had two portraits, quite fawning. One of Robert Kagan, the neocon who brought us into Iraq, and the other Tony Blair, who was <laughs> known as Bush's poodle. Now, okay, but where's the coverage of those who opposed the war from the outset? back then, and who understood what the consequences might be. I mean, Barbara Lee, or someone who's involved with the anti-war movement. You don't, see the, you don't see enough of those faces. So the debate inside Washington. President Obama's in a very tight fix. I mean, it's, you have a debate that is about downsized politics, in my view. It is not representing this country. It's an establishment debate, and it's driving toward a military outcome. Which you mentioned that we're hearing from these same uh, voices again. So you turn on the, uh, the talk shows on TV, you get Paul Wolfowitz again, you get it's, Paul it's, Brenner, Dick Cheney is writing op-ed pieces. It, it, it seems like never, never land to me. I don't, I don't know what happens to accountability in a democracy. There's, there should be some mechanism. I mean, James Fallows of The Atlantic, and I wrote about this in a Washington Post column, said, Here's rule one. Those who counseled us to get into this war should not be advising us now. Haven't we learned enough from these neocons that we don't want to hear from them again? And I also think, you know, all power to these people, not to be glib about it. If they're so fierce about this, let them go enlist. Let them, I mean, we don't have a draft anymore, so we don't have a mechanism for a lot of people. But good for the common sense of this people, uh, common sense of the people in this country who understand that we're not doing ourselves, this country, any good, security-wise or other, by going into these messes. Well, that and I don't like when people, by the way, say it's isolationist, because I think there is a strand of isolationism in this country. And I think our foreign policy, by the way, is in disarray. There are all these schools, and there are possibilities of alliances. But I think Americans have a gut sense, common sense, that they're not being you know, given a good option from too many of the leaders. Well, you touched on another pet peeve of yeah. mine. Um, you know, it, fewer than 1% of the population uh, have participated in these mm -hmm. wars or in, or in the armed forces. So uh, most of the, the population a has no connection at all. They're, right. they're either not in the service or they don't have relatives or close friends um, mm -hmm. in the service. That makes it very easy to say, you know, go ahead and do it. Go off to war. Let's, let's fight these wars. And then you don't have to pay the price of, right. the, uh, of the terrible things that happen to these young men and, and women when they're in combat. I think that if a country is going to fight a war, I think everybody should have to make sacrifices. I agree. And, uh, the, and, the, and the Bush, what Bush did was just uh, a travesty. 
he cut taxes. He, he, cut, he cut taxes, taxes twice. So everyone's feeling good about That's that. That's never happened never in happened American in history time. before, Republican or Democratic administrations. And but also think of the VA scandal. I mean, I think the real scandal is that we're not funding adequately an agency, the Veterans that's Administration, right. if we're going to send vets to war. We have an obligation. We have an obligation. And I think that's gotten lost in the scandal. Um, but it, I think people do see, you know, you've covered the veterans coming home. Very much so. It's, you know, they're coming home in different ways. They're coming home to honor, but they're also coming home to brain injuries. They're surviving in ways that people in communities see them. So I think that does bring and home the war. And they're coming home uh, after having lost limbs. Uh, they're coming home paralyzed. They're coming home with terrible burn in injuries. Uh, tremendous numbers have lost their hearing because of the, yeah. 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 Uh, and multiple uh, deployments. Uh, uh, multiple de deployments. It, it's really, um, it's, 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 it's a scandal that more is not made of the suffering that has resulted uh, from these wars. Yeah. But um, getting um, back to Iraq itself, I mean, we didn't just uh, invade and depose Saddam Hussein. I mean, we destroyed Iraq's political and, infrastructure. and, and, and military uh, infrastructure. Uh, we, the, the Ba'ath Party was right. co completely um, ousted, uh, dismantled right. the armed forces and, and, and that sort of thing. I mean, it was a, a, a recipe for sectarian yeah. Violence. But since we did do all of that, mm -hmm. what, if any, obligations do we have to the Iraqi people now, or can we just turn around and say we're walking away? I think the obligation is um, there's been discussion of reparations. That isn't going to fly in our politics, but there is an enormous humanitarian catastrophe in the region, as you know. I mean, in Syria, millions of displaced people in Iraq. I think instead of fanning the flames of sectarianism with military strikes, we would be wise to organize regional and international diplomacy which would focus on humanitarian assistance and focus on getting people to a table and trying to be part of a dialogue involved with the key players in this region. One of the few silver linings in this moment is that America is now engaging in dialogue with Iran. Right. And we should have been in a broader, more robust way with the election of a new president in the last year and a half, Rouhani. But we need to bring the players together and be part of that. Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, even Russia is a regional right. player if we're going to resolve Syria. I think we need to stop sending arms into the region. And this idea of the hubris that we can select the moderates, we've seen this before. You know, you select those who then turn and have your arms, and that's a very dangerous. So I'm not, I'm not I, there are no good solutions, Bob, but I do think the military one is the worst, and I do believe in a kind of do no harm and doing as much as one can in the humanitarian, diplomatic, political way. Now, one of the things I worry about is uh, this group ISIS, the Islamic yes. State uh, in Iraq and in, in Syria, um, the, the group that has taken over um, yeah. some of these Sunni areas in Iraq and also uh, in Syria, um, that it is possible for them to establish a safe haven for um, terrorists. And if that were to be the case, and if that were to lead to attacks or attempted attacks on the United States. Right, politically. Uh, is, is, is there any way for the U.S. to resist responding militarily, um, putting boots on the ground, going in there and that sort of thing? Could you imagine the nation uh, in response to that supporting military I don't see, action? I don't see, I really don't. First of all, that, that's, let's the, walk by it, the walk, nation, walk I mean, it. No, the, the nation, nation the magazine. The United, oh, the nation I mean, magazine. I mean the magazine, Oh, yeah. no. Uh, and I don't think the nation as a country would support boots on the ground. But let's walk back a minute. We don't know enough about ISIS. We do know it's not really an Al-Qaeda affiliate, nor have we seen um, that it's intent on the West. It's a regional dynamic. Sunni, Shia attacks, terrorist attacks, brutal attacks in the region. I worry that if we get more militarily involved, you do see then the fueling of anti-Western impulses. That crusade mentality, which isn't fully, we haven't seen letters, we haven't seen video. They do have all these videos and documents explaining their motives. So I think we need to, um, you know, be, I, I just think a military strike is going to inflame 
And I think we need to police and do intelligence and as you know, protect this nation, this nation as best we can. But boots on the ground, I don't even see this country supporting even in the wake of a, of a terrorist attack. The um, Daily News, um, yeah. oh, good. my old newspaper. Yeah, that's right. You have, we've <laughs> they, talked two of your old newspapers. <laughs> they, uh, they ran a pretty inflammatory front page headline uh, recently. With it, there was a picture, a large picture, of uh, Iraqi soldiers apparently uh, being executed. Uh, and the huge front page headline said, Al-Qaeda nation is being bloodily born before the world's eyes. The world is reaping what Obama helped sow. Now, I've been critical of President Obama on a number yeah. of issues uh, over the years, but that struck me as exceedingly unfair. So talk about this idea that Obama and the Obama administration are the ones responsible for this meltdown in Iraq. I mean, I guess, I guess it's, it, that hinges on this idea that in beginning to withdraw, in withdrawing U.S. troops, he opened a vacuum into which these forces came. No, it was the invasion of 2003 which fueled the sectarian divisions, the surge of 2006, 2007, which brought the Sunnis into a bigger force. Um, and never forget that Obama, um, it was Bush who signed the status of force agreements in 2008. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and right. Obama, who you know, was negotiating with Maliki, who was under such pressure within his own country because of hatred of America and the occupying forces, there was no way that the military would allow those forces to stay because Iraq wouldn't give immunity right. and other. Um, I think this idea, that in withdrawing U.S. forces, you create an al-Qaeda is terribly wrong-headed. I would refer the Daily News, for example, <laughs> uh, if it is as obsessed as the Republicans <laughs> with Benghazi, which has just become a oh brutal, goodness, ridiculous right. obsession. There is a real scandal there, but not the one they think it is. Um, Reagan, 1983, the terrorist bombings of the barracks Marine in Barrett's Beirut and exactly. the embassy. Right. What did he do? A few months later, he picked up and left. He left. Exactly and right. where was, you know, that was a measure, in my mind, of s smart approach to the situation. And, where, you know, politically, it didn't register. Right. And so I think you're seeing, you know, is this a shocker? No, but a politicization of what needs to be more of a discussion of how do you fight terrorism in a smart way as opposed to exactly. a sledgehammer, stupid way, which... So, they want uh, to sell newspapers. <laughs> uh, let's broaden this uh, um, a little bit and uh, talk about uh, President Obama's foreign policy in general. There's, a, there's just been a series of crises. I mean, there's Syria, yeah, of course. Um, there's um, Ukraine. Um, we're still in Afghanistan after all these years, and it was, you know, uh, pretty recently we lost uh, five more service members, right. uh, apparently in a friendly fire, uh, a tragic friendly fire. Um, uh, incident. How do you think the administration ha and his the president's poll numbers, especially in terms of foreign policy, have been plummeting? How do you think uh, the administration has done on foreign policy in general? I don't think there's an Obama doctrine. I think we're living at a moment when the old order is kind of disappearing. The new one is not yet born, and you have a president in this cusp-like. I think he's. I dislike this view that uh, he's leaned back hasn't been aggressive enough. A view, by the, the Republicans way... Republicans like to say leading from behind. Leading from behind, but by the way, it's not just Republicans. He has two, one is current, one is former, foreign policy assistants, slaughter and power. Yeah. I mean, Anne-Marie Slaughter had a very tough op-ed in the New York Times today saying he should go into both I Iraq and Syria. And power has not, in my mind, used the forces of the UN to its best effect. I think Obama has done right on Syria, been pushed into it in a sense. I think he was, um, though there's arming of uh, Syrian uh, extremists by proxy via Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia, I think not right not to go in. I think that that chemical weapons agreement was a very important framework for others, even though some say it's not working. Keep pushing it. That's right. better as a proliferation effort. Ukraine, I think, is the culmination of a 20, 25 year NATO expansion policy, which was the wrong. Uh, route to take in dealing with Russia. We need Russia on getting out of Afghanistan, on terrorism, on proliferation, on the Middle East, on Syria. And I think we're at a very bad moment. Ru Ukraine needs both Russia and the West, not one or the other. And the EU and I think our country has said my way or the highway. But I think on balance, Obama, his West Point speech, is pointing toward a different role for America, one where military force 
is not the first resort and that restraint, which has been the hallmark of the better presidents, is used and working in tandem with other countries. I'd simply say also that military force in the 21st century, sadly, we're still consumed with the global war on terror. But if you think of the great and staggering challenges of our time, it's global inequality, it's pandemics, it is proliferation of nukes, it's climate change. And terrorism is part of that. But the fact that it has so consumed our country has not done well. And Obama's tried to move, but he keeps getting pulled back in. So the obsession with terror, which, you know, it's, it's a very serious problem. Yes. I, I don't want to minimize no, the problem but the, by any means. But the obsession uh, with terror prevents us from addressing these other, other challenges and threats. It, 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 exactly it should be right. on the spectrum. It shouldn't be consuming because in that consuming nature, I think it's distorted our priorities. Uh, you know, um, do you think, you mentioned that there is not really an, an Obama doctrine. Right. Um, do you think that the administration or the president has done a good enough job keeping the American public informed in the loop so that there's a, a grasp or an understanding of what the administration is trying to do? On foreign policy? On foreign policy. Um, here's, here's the problem. I think it has not done so, but do you know of a previous administration which has? I think the disconnect on foreign policy is that a lot of Americans tune out unless it's really is part of their life. You've talked about vets, maybe in, you know, there, or trade issues. Trade issues are very concrete in millions of Americans' lives as their plants leave their cities and towns. I think the president has... Um, not done a strong enough job, and the media, and I'm saying, you know, we've talked about the limits and the liabilities right. of a media, um, which is often sensationalistic, often too consumed with terrorism, often, um, you know, fanning the flames, has filled that vacuum, and that speaks to a broader problem. It is problem. the kind of issue that sells. I mean, when I was at the Daily News, you know, you just read that, de you know, yeah. that deadline. And that's simple. And it's, it's, it's also a, an easy, simplistic uh, story to tell to television viewers where you don't have a lot of time or a newspaper headline. But, you know, here's the bottom line. And I wish it would, we need to reorient our, reorient our country so hope sells, but fear, fear sells. And people, and the media, for, to a large extent, it preys on people's fears, as opposed, as I said earlier, to kind of Look at some of these issues. I think climate is beginning to emerge as a big issue. But the economy, Bob, the fact that the economy, think of the global economy. That should be a central issue. And if you could speak to that more effectively, it seems to me people in this country would relate to a foreign policy that was about rebuilding a middle class at home and rebuilding a global middle class. That should be one of the great goals of America. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I wish we had more time. We're going to stop there. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, thank, thank you very much for thank you. spending this time with us. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. In 1953, the CIA orchestrated a coup that overthrew the democratically elected Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh. That tragic adventure resulted in the despotic reign of the Shah of Iran, the seizure of American hostages when the Shah was overthrown in 1979, and decades of tragic enmity between the U.S. and Iran right up to the present day. In 1962, the U.S. launched the monumentally absurd Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba which was supposed to drive Fidel Castro from power. It didn't just fail at the cost of many lives. It proved to be, as the historian James T. Patterson wrote, one of the most disastrous military ventures in modern American history. In 1963, less than a month before John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the president of South Vietnam, Ngo Dinh Diem, was murdered in another CIA-backed coup. The war that unfolded over the next several years took 58,000 American lives and two to three million Vietnamese. We somehow always seem to believe that through the use of brute force, we can shape the events in foreign lands to our liking, and we are always wrong. In 2003, we tried it again in Iraq. The American people were told that once the murderous Saddam Hussein was gone, democracy would blossom in Iraq like the flowers of spring. Not quite. More than a decade later, the horrors we unleashed in Iraq 
continue to unfold and no one knows how to stop the bleeding. We need to give up on this idea that the solution to every problem is a bullet or a bomb, and that if things go wrong, the answer is more bullets and more bombs. There has to be a better way. That's it for this week. See you next time.